Nate. Thanks, Nate. Love you, buddy. We'll see you in a bit. Welcome to One Two Church. I'm Pastor Matt. Apparently, you guys didn't get the memo. Um, do you know that Super Bowl Sunday is the least attended church service of the year? And to see all of you guys, that's that's amazing. Second is Father's Day. So, men, we got some work to do. Okay. <laughs> I don't know what the third one is. It, it's definitely not Mother's Day. Father's Day is, what do you want to do? Golf, hang out, watch TV. Mother's Day in my house is, can we go plant shopping and get a bunch of plants and plant them in the garden? We got some, yeah, amen to that. But I want to welcome you. We are in a brand new sermon series. We just started our, our finished our anxious sermon series, how to deal with anxiousness in our life. And the answer is Jesus. Jesus. Yes, all of it will work. Whatever it is. This, this wasn't a 10-step uh, process and you'll remove anxiety forever. It was all pointing us back to Jesus. And that led us, leads us into this sermon series. And let me tell you why I'm so passionate about this. It's because if you've grown up in church or if you've heard about church or know Christians or you are a Christian, sometimes there's a lot of confusion when it comes to religion and Christianity. I want you to know that God is not the author of confusion. But there's also a lot of times where there's verses that are taken out of context and it's used to hurt people or it's misinterpreted. Now, I'm not saying that my interpretation is correct. I'm, I'm saying for this sermon series, let's just look at what Jesus did. Look at, let's look at what Jesus said, the red letters of Jesus, and let's just do that. Now, it sounds easy, right? It's a, it's a lot harder than you think, but I think if we, uh, if we simplify it and get down to the basics, it worked the first time, right? Jesus changed the world the first time, and then we added a bunch of stuff afterwards, and, and we, we've changed some things. But if we get back to the basis of what worked originally, I think our lives will be uh, blessed. And I think the people around us, there, there will be more love. There will be more forgiveness. Uh, God is also not the author of, of condemnation. And so if you go out of here feeling less about yourself in a bad way of saying, and I've really got to get my act together. I'm doing a lot of bad things. The, the message wasn't portrayed correctly. We should leave this building thinking more about Jesus than we do ourselves. Every single mess, message that we have. It, it can be a, a, lot of, a lot of confusion, a lot of self-focus. But I want to just look at what Jesus did and, and do that. It, but I, wanna, I want to uh, warn you that this is not going to be easy. The words of Jesus are not easy. We're going to talk a lot about some really tough subjects. Subjects that may not be talked about enough in church. Or subjects that may have been misinterpreted in church. We're going to talk about money. And I want you to know at One Two Church, we don't want anything from you. Nothing. That's between you and the Lord. We want to be able to give you a good message. I, I'm, we're, we're, we're not a church that passes the plate, if you noticed. Because that's a relationship between you and God. So I'm not, when we talk about money, I want, I want to look at it in the lens of what did Jesus say about money? We're also going to talk about other other tough subjects like we are today about love, about forgiveness, about what the church should be like. Let's just do that. Let's pray. Father, I ask that you uh, just overwhelm us with your spirit. That you speak through me, Lord. Let, let me take the backstage and you step forward. Lord, if there's anything in this message that... Um, you want me to deviate from, let me do it. Or let it be not be my words, but your words. And I pray that we can open our hearts and our minds to the message of you, to what you said to us. You changed the world. And you've asked certain things of us. Let us be courageous enough to do that today. In your name we pray. Amen. I have an honest question. Are you happy? Happy is a weird word, but I want to ask you, are you happy? If the answer is yes, I want to ask you why. And the, if the answer is no, I want you to ask yourself the question, why? 
Are you happy? And if you're, if you're new to church, if you're not familiar with this Christian culture, the answer that, that Christians will give is, yes, I'm happy. Why? Because the Lord Jesus saved us from our sins. We're happy because of Jesus. I, I, today I'm not happy. For one simple fact, I really think my dogs are plotting against me. It may sound weird, but my wife's gone. And if you know my wife, the dogs are her life. Our daughter moved out, went to college, moved away, and she added three dogs to our, our family to fill the void that I wasn't filling in her life. But with mom gone, there's some weirdness around our house. So the, our French bulldog, Ella, that's mine. So, so she is, that, that's dad's dad's girl. If dad's home, everything's good. If dad's gone, she's weird. The two big ones, I think, are plotting against me because it's just up and down. You see them laying next to each other, like face to face. And I think he's come. Where's mom? What did, what did this guy do with mom? This morning, this morning at 5 a.m., we have tile stairs that go up to our bedroom. Everything is tile, no carpet. And this, usually what I do is in the morning, I'll walk downstairs with the lights off and then just have some coffee. Well, this morning I decided to turn the lights on and one of the, our, our, our blind one, he had peed on the top of the stairs right where I would have been walking. And in my head, I take that as he, they're setting little traps, <laughs> setting, setting traps because they want to know where mom is. I tell them all the time, mom's coming home Thursday. Everything is going to be fine. But the, the question is, are you happy? Now, I've been... Uh, I've been married for 21 years and, and Crystal at certain times will ask me the question, hey, are you happy? And it's almost like a, a check-in of our relationship, a check-in of my personal life with the Lord, a kind of a check-in, a reminder. A, and sometimes when I'm not choosing to have a good, a good attitude, she'll ask that question, hey, are you happy? Because it's, let's, let's talk about this. <laughs> How do you... How do you know, how many of you know that uh, wives, you ask questions just like Jesus? Because when Jesus asks questions, he doesn't want to reply. He's making a point that he is the answer. Like it's a rhetorical question. And wives, you are just like that. When my wife asks me, are you happy? It's a rhetorical question. And look at all that God has blessed you with. You have, you have a good family. You have good friends. You have a good community, amazing church. Things, things are happening. Are you happy? And sometimes I give the pastor answer of, yeah, God's faithful. He saved me. Amen. And, and Crystal, at, at times she's, she says, no, digs down. And she's like, I want to know the truth. And she changed the phrase on me once. It was two years ago. She said, what, what are you excited about today? Like right now, what are you excited about? She wanted to know the truth. And I didn't give her the pastor answer. I, I said, this is revealing and embarrassing, but she was like, what are you happy about right at this moment? And I said, I, I have three packages coming in from Amazon Prime. <laughs> and she said, are you serious? I said, yeah, I got my, I got my inch over golf clubs because the golf clubs that I was using, I, I had to hunch down so low to play. I have a towel coming, a golf towel, a WSU Cougars, any Cougar fans in here? WSU Cougar towel that would go on it, and then I had a little ball cleaner that would go, on, go with it. And I was so happy. The next day she asked me the same question. She said, are you happy? And I said, no, because my package was late and it ruined my, my entire day. How many of you know that if it's not prime, you're not gonna order it, okay? You got it. You got a story about Prime that was like $50 for $6 something. But if it's not Prime, I'm not going to order it. But that's what I was, I put this in perspective. That's what I was living, living for at that time. I have a Savior in Jesus Christ. I have an amazingly beautiful wife that is way out of my league. Amen. And I have a... I have a daughter that, that is fantastic. I have a community that I call home. I don't live in California. Everything is great. <laughs> we have a lot of people watching from California right now. I just, they won't, they, they usually sleep in and then watch it. <laughs> it's so true. I don't live in California and that's, that's awesome to me. But there's so many things to be happy about. Is anyone from California here? <laughs> Carrie, <laughs> Carrie lived literally like where Crystal and I lived 
and now we're here. So that, that's wild to me. But my, the 39-year-old me at the time, a grown man, was excited that any moment, any moment, a package could be delivered. And I would have my towel. I would have my golf clubs. I was visualizing the fairway. I just hoped one time I would be able to hit the fairway. But I, in my head, I was just playing it over and over. And it ruined my day when I, when I didn't get it. But how, how funny are we? Because if, if we aren't careful, our natural orientation to existence, our journey, our life can be as temporal or, I say this hesitantly, selfish, as getting boxes in the mail. Are you happy? Are you happy? Let's, let's go to the words of, of Jesus in Luke chapter 10. It says, Behold, and you've if you've grown up in church or if you've heard about church, you've probably heard the story. Behold, a, a lawyer stood up to him to, to the test. Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, what is written in the law? How do you read it? I love Jesus. These are his words. What is written in the law? How do you read it? And the lawyer answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. One, two. That's... For those who don't know the meaning behind one, two, that's the meaning. Love God, love your neighbor. And then he goes on to say, you have answered correctly. Just do that. And you will live. But he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Listen to these words. Who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, and he tells his parable. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead, half dead. Now, by chance, a priest was going down that road and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he sent him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper saying, take care of him. Listen to these words, take care of him. And whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? And he said, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, just do that. You go and do likewise. Are you happy? Jesus came to earth. He, he introduced to us a whole different way of living. This direction, this perspective of, of where we're heading. Not only saved us, gave, gave us new life, gave us birth but it's given us a new orientation to human existence, a new orientation. And we see it in this passage. Notice the approach of the lawyer in his question. Jesus is answering this lawyer's question, which he's trying to demonstrate to the lawyer who he is. The lawyer is trying to get a loophole so he doesn't have to love his neighbor and save himself through the law. And Jesus says, I am the fulfillment of the law standing right here. So when he uses those words of love, love God and love your neighbor, that's the fulfillment of the law. Jesus said, hang all the law and the prophets on these two commandments of love God, love your neighbor. And the lawyer asked this classic question. We tend to demonize this lawyer, don't we? He, oh, he's such a bad guy. No, he's a normal guy. We ask these questions. He's asking a normal question. He's saying, hey, who is my neighbor? You know, I look around and I see these people. Uh, I don't know some of them, but who is my neighbor? And, and the Bible is saying that his motivation was himself. So his life starts with himself. Have you, have you noticed that we are born as childhood prodigies when it comes to thinking about ourselves? I can think, I can think about myself without even thinking about it. It's just, it just comes to us. The statements, the conversations, the actions can give us away. The natural orientation to life is what? Me. Me. You don't have to teach a child to say mine, do you? It's, it's me. And he says, who is my neighbor? And Jesus tells this outrageous story that is impossible. And listen, the, listen to this orientation. The lawyer says, who is my neighbor? And Jesus responds, who proved to be a neighbor? 
Listen to that switch that Jesus did. It's interesting. The lawyer said, I can't find a neighbor. I can't find one. And Jesus says, no, the point is that you be one. Wait, 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 wait. Now I have to act selfless. You know, it's convenient for us to say, you know, I would be a neighbor, but I can't find a neighbor. No one wants to be with me. I don't know, really know what one is. So I'm just going to sit back and I'm going to order more packages on Amazon Prime because when I see my name on a box, I just get all excited. And Jesus is saying, just be a neighbor. Think beyond yourself. Serve others, care for others. Even in this parable, it is bookended by radical transformation on how we view life. It's so indicative of the teachings of Jesus. Jesus taught this paradoxical way of teaching where he's saying stuff like, if you want to find your life, then lose it. The first shall be last and the last shall be first. Jesus came to teach us that the road to joy is not just buying yourself stuff. It's not serving yourself. It's serving others. Look at this in the Acts. The, the next verse that we have in, the, in Acts. G, this is the beginning of the church. And it says, in everything I've done, I've demonstrated to you how necessary it is to work on behalf of the weak and not exploit them. You'll not likely go wrong here if you keep remembering that our master said, so words of Jesus, that's the sermon series, you're far happier giving than getting. Some are, you're, you're more blessed when you give than when you receive. It's serving others. Are you happy? Why? Well, I... I, I have these golf clubs coming and I have a towel coming and I have a ball cleaner coming and it, it didn't come and now it's late and I'm not happy anymore. What in the world? Yeah, because I still believe I'm far happier getting than giving. And Jesus is saying you're, you'll be far happier when living from a perspective of being a neighbor than the selfish perspective of, well, actually, who is my neighbor? Like, do I have to love everyone? Then and, and don't say that guy because I didn't mean to point to you. I love him. Don't say don't say that guy because it's really hard to love that guy. And Jesus is saying the path to happiness is oftentimes the path less traveled. It's living beyond yourself. I want you to know that one of the big ideas behind this church and in this room and in this church community is that we have collectively agreed that Jesus is the point of life. He's the only one that can save us. He's the love of our life, only one to fulfill the law. That three and a half years, he manifested his ministry in this lifestyle approach of a servant leader, where he gave his life away, now leaves his spirit for us so that we will follow in, our, in his footsteps in our lives. And now we're coming together so that on a Monday or even on a Sunday night, you can begin a week of living beyond yourself. And at this point, there's some people that would say that, man, that's a good message. That's a good message, Pastor. I've been so selfish this week. I need to be more selfless. I, I, hope, I really hope Crystal's listening online. We really have to, to be more selfless in our walk. That's good. I need it to hit me. Hit me, Pastor. Hit me with a hard self. So we start to live selfless, selfless in spurts because it's the right thing to do. No, actually, it's about following Jesus. And he's saying that will bring you more joy by following him. God will give us joy in the process. The more I give, the happier I get. It's beyond myself. Now, if we can all agree on that, I want to approach this parable one more time. Even if you don't believe in Jesus, like whatever range you are on the spiritual spectrum, I actually think we can still all agree that when you serve, when you give, it releases this emotional reaction that is fulfilling and sustainable. It just does. So wherever, wherever you are, whether you believe in Jesus or not, I think we can agree that the path to joy is not getting, but giving. Think about it. When you, when, what's your favorite part about Christmas? For me, it's watching people unwrap gifts that I have spent all this time and effort and I'm like, this will be the perfect gift. Or giving something without expecting anything in return. It just releases this emotion in us. Now, with that in mind, let's approach this parable again. Jesus is telling the story about who he is. And he's saying, let's just do that. The Good Samaritan story isn't as much about the lawyer or the Samaritan. 
or the her as it is Jesus. Jesus says a man was traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho, which this was a real highway back in the time. Jerusalem to Jericho, a, a big highway. So much, so much of our life is what? Live from there, here to there, here to there. Now, if in my view, I, I've, I have thoughts that I'm like, if I just get there, then I'll be happy. Only to get there and have to reinvent a new there because that there that I thought would make me happy didn't fulfill me the way that I needed to. So now I have to reinvent a different Jericho to go to. And we're told, if you get from here to there, the money will come in. The happiness will come in. Things will work out. But life happens, doesn't it? And unexpectedly, this, this hurt comes. And whether we've hurt ourselves or hurt others, or others have hurt us, we find ourselves broken and dying. And what the lawyer doesn't realize in the story is, he's not the good Samaritan in this story. He's the man beaten and dying on the side of the road. And the Bible says half dead, half dead. It's once again indicative of the human condition. You can be alive on the outside, but spiritually dead on the inside. And it's half dead. This half dead man is dying. He's bleeding out. And Jesus goes into this dramatic story where this man is just beaten by the side of the road. And thank God a priest comes by. A teacher of the law. The law came by to save that man and went to the other side of the road because the law couldn't save him. The law is incapable of saving us. We, we tend to deviate from the words of Jesus back to, well, this is more structured back in the Old Testament. And, and there's some laws and some things that I need to keep. And it, it, stru structure in my life just makes me happier. But it, was, it reminds us that there are 600 plus laws in the Torah and you couldn't even keep one. Because the Bible says you break one, you break them all. And the law passes by and doesn't save the man. Then the Levite, another indication of the law, passes by and couldn't save him. Us trying to save us. We're trying to save ourselves. We're trying to get better. We're trying to do certain things in our life to be able to be saved from being half dead. And beaten on the side of the road. And Jesus says here, he says, but a Samaritan comes by. The Jewish audience that he's talking to must have sucked air of gas of saying, no, no. Samaritans at that time were called half breeds. They, they were marginalized. There was extreme prejudice in Jesus's day. And I want you to remember that Samaritans re were rejected by the Jews. What was said about Jesus? That he was rejected by his own. So here comes this rejected Samaritan who I believe Jesus is likening himself to because no one is this good but God. He sees this man who has rejected him, overlooked him, and he moves towards the pain. And he comes down off the animal. Comes down. He comes down. I've heard that before somewhere. Then he's bandaging up the wounds. wounds and where does he place them? He places them where he was up on, the, on his Donkey put, places them up. So now you have the, the, the uh, half beaten man up on the animal while the good Samaritan comes down to where the, the beaten man was. They have switched places. And you know that verse is that the uh, he who knew no sin became sin so we could become the righteousness of God and Jesus Christ. That's the gospel. He's given us the gospel in here. We trade places with our good Samaritan. And the story starts to unfold and we realize Jesus is preaching the gospel to a lawyer who can't see past the law. And he's telling them who he is. And also, this is who I am. And the classic, Jesus, he ends the story just going and live like that. As if that is possible. Because when Jesus says live like that, Jesus means 100% of the time. It's impossible. And he's saying, I know, which points us to our good Samaritan, which points us to our Savior. But I would like to argue in this particular passage that if the only point is to deliver this gospel, this revealing story, the gospel to the lawyer, I think before we get to where he takes the lawyer, I think the story has already done its work. Like he's already done it. He's already explained the gospel right there. 
But for some reason, Jesus wants us to know that the Good Samaritan takes the dying man to an inn. He takes him to an inn. He stays with him to care with him during care for him during the night. He leaves two days worth of wages at the end. And Jesus wants the lawyer and us to know that he tells the innkeeper, take care of them. And whatever more that you spend, I'll Venmo you. I'll send you the money. I'll repay what, what I have when I return. When I return. So coming down. And when I return, I've heard that before somewhere. Jesus is coming back. Then the story closes and Jesus says, who proved to be a neighbor? And you know how much prejudice was happening is the lawyer wouldn't even say the name Samaritan. He just said, the, you know, that guy, that guy. But, but what's going on with this inn, with this little inn? I'd like to suggest that Jesus is hinting to the church he said he was going to build. He said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. The Bible says that God sets members in, in the body as he pleases. Translation, Jesus brings people to church. I didn't bring you to church. The, whoever invited you didn't bring you to church. You know what did? A stirring in your soul of saying, I need to go to church. Jesus puts the members in the body, in the church. And he does that in this story too. If in fact the Good Samaritan is pointing us to Jesus, by the way, it's all about Jesus. The answer is always Jesus. And if you've grown up in Sunday school, I got away with so much when they're like, who parted the Red Sea? Jesus. Well, yeah, but, but who else? Jesus. Well, who walked on water? Jesus. Who else? Jesus. I, I wasn't paying attention, but I would always just say Jesus. And they're like, that's a, that's a phenomenal answer. It's always about Jesus. I wonder if he's telling us that when he rescues people, when he saves people, he takes them to church. He puts the solitary in family. I wonder if that's why in this story, for, and I believe it's for us now, Jesus tells us details of what he says to the innkeeper. Details, statements. He puts it in there because I wonder if we're supposed to do that. I wonder if Jesus is hinting that the church is supposed to look like this little inn. Now, if you say, Matt, this is taking this too far. You're, you're reading into something. It's a little risky what you're doing. I'd like to say, okay, the, the four observations that I have, I'm going to have two today and two next week. It's going to be part two, so you've got to come. But if I, if, I, if I am, in fact, taking this parable too far, well... They're very true about the lifestyle of Jesus regardless. The man picks him up and brings him to an inn. And I wonder, why, why didn't Jesus just say, I took him to his house? Because home is too far. Home is too far. He took him to the place close by, which was an inn. Now, in antiquity, if you don't know this, the, the, the rise of inns was because there was such a demand. What was happening in reality, in real time, in real life, where there was this freeway between Jerusalem and Jericho, and it was being known that people were being pillaged, they were being robbed, they were being beaten, and they were being raped. Most of the time, in the cover of night, thieves would hide along the road, and here comes these vulnerable people, and thieves would steal and pillage them. And naturally, there was a demand. So a group of people get together, said, if we put little inns along the freeway, close to where it gets dark, close to the pain, close to the hurt, where people are being robbed and stolen from, we can provide them food and shelter. And here popularized this idea of an inn. Not, not so much a, a, a motel, hotel, or holiday inn, say what name, but it was a very plain, simple, purposeful structure that allowed travelers Vulnerable people to come and find haven. And guess what? They were treated as guests of honor. And these little ants, no matter who you were, treated as guests of honor. And Jesus knew this when he's telling this story. And the good Samaritan took him where? The place closest to the pain. My first observation of this in, though, when I look at this and think about this, Remember, it's better to give than to receive. That's, why, that's what we're talking about today. The first observation is the proximity to the pain. 
And I wonder if Jesus is alluding to us that our lives are not to avoid the pain, but to move towards people in pain. And I wonder if, if this backstory of the end, Jesus inserted it into the story so we could pick up on, on the idea that maybe Jesus takes people to church and church is supposed to be where people are and where it's darkest and where there's so much pain and where there's so much hurt. The church is supposed to be in the midst of the pain, not removed from the pain. This, this thing that we're building, that God is building here, the, these walls, it's not supposed to look like a country club. It's supposed to be purposeful. It's supposed to be bloody and dirty, almost like an emergency room is what church needs to be. Proximity to pain. Are you like me? I have, a, I have a motto. No pain, no pain. <laughs> and I, I fully believe that. And yesterday, I didn't go by that. <laughs> and Andrew really put me in some pain in that, that uh, faith and fitness thing. But I, you guys need to join that. It's the second Saturday of every month. We go in and read a few verses in the Bible. We really ponder on it. And then he just beats you up for 18 minutes. <laughs> but I, I have this motto. No pain, no pain. In my life, that's a great motto. Do you like to work out? No. You should? No. I'm, I'm good. I'd rather just not put my body through the pain. Like no pain, no pain. Some people like pain. And I'm the weird one here. We, it's... Avoiding the pain is what I'm used to. I don't like pain, but when I consider my hero, my savior, my model for living, he did not avoid pain. He moved towards the pain. And just like the Good Samaritan, just, just like in the Garden of Gethsemane, where he moved towards the pain and it was painful and he was crying out, Lord, if there's any other way, let this cup pass from me. But not my will, but your will. He went through the pain. He endured the cross. He took on the pain. Do you know he saw you and I in the future in 2022 and he moved towards our pain and went through our pain. It should motivate us to be the type of church that is close to the pain. I said this in 2020. I told my wife, I said, I, I just need one week. I just need one week from God where something tragic doesn't happen to our loved ones, to our family, to those I love, to our community, to the world, just to the country. I, I, need, I need just a week without anything. And she, she delicately, delicately reminded me what we signed up for when we decided to follow Jesus. We signed up to put ourselves in the middle of other people's pain. That, that's our job. Do you? Do we think that way at One Two Church? I pray this is true of our community. Look at John 1.14 in the message version. I love how it says this. The word became flesh and blood, blood and did what? He moved into the neighborhood. He moved into the neighborhood. The, the incarnation, which is a sophisticated word of that God put on skin and bones and, and came into our neighborhood. The incarnation is the ultimate indictment of us removing ourselves from people's problems and pain. Is that Jesus put on skin and bone, bones and moved into the neighborhood and we want to avoid neighborhoods and want to avoid pain. This, you may say, this is a challenging message. message. These are the words of Jesus that I want to live our life by. He said, we saw the glory with our own eyes. The one of a kind glory, like father, like son. Generous inside and out, true from start to finish. I wonder if we follow him and we do what we did, that this will be true of us. Where, where's the neighborhood where there's pain? Where is it bleak? Where are people broken? Where are people hurt? I wonder if God would send one, two church to places like that. And you may say, well, you're going to have different locations. Do you know you are the location? You are the location. Church is not a building. It's a people group where everywhere we go, where there's pain, we more move towards it, not from it. And I believe our church was built because God knew there was pain on this island. So he went up and got my wife and I and said, there is pain here. And we set up shops so, it, so if home is too far away for some people, we were right here ready to house you. The second, second observation of this, and remember this is about joy, happiness and joy. 
It's found in the, the uh, Good Samaritan words to the innkeeper. Look at this, verse 35. Verse 35. These words just struck me right in my heart. It says, take care of him. That was the first thing he said to him. Take care of him. No other response. Take, take care of him. Proximity to pain. I, I pray that is true about our church. And number two, permission to care. Permission to care. He says, take care of him. Hey, take care of him. But what's his story? Take care of him. But how did he get this way? Take care of him. But what side of the tracks is he from? Take care of him. But what's his background? Take care of him. What does he vote? Take care of him. Is he Democrat or Republican? Take care of him. Do you see any asterisks or, or distinctions here? At what point would the Good Samaritan tell the innkeeper, hey, 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 by the way, he didn't do this to himself, so it's okay to care for him. There, there is none of that in here. This is, this is a tragedy that happened, so you can feel free to take care of him because he, he really didn't do this to himself. And the innkeeper's like, oh, okay, thank you so much. Is he a drug user? Take care of him. Did he do this to himself? Is he the reason why he's here? Take care of him. So we're just going to take care of him? Yeah, permission to care. Permission to care. Can, can I... Can I be a little stronger? Out of love. Out of love. In an effort so you can have some more joy. I want to I wanna be bold with you today, church. If, uh, if you aren't familiar with Christianity, one of the things that has happened over time... Is Christians have been so scared of being perceived as condoning people's errors and wrongs and sin, we have abdicated our call to care. Because I would never want my care to be convoluted as condoning. So, so I will remove myself. I will have no proximity to your pain and certainly won't care about your pain because if I do care, some of the church folk th might think that I'm okay with you and I'm not. Jesus has given us permission to care, church. Permission to care. Just take care. I want to stand here as pastor of One Two Church and, and say that we reserve the right to care about anyone and everyone. We reserve the right to care about anyone and everyone. Permission to care. In fact, I, I sometimes wonder if we are living the journey Jesus has called us to live with the perspective, the focus, the approach that Jesus has called us to live out if we're not being criticized like Jesus. Look at Luke 15. You know what his critic says? This was the criticism of Jesus. Now the tax collectors and sinners, the church people were all drawing near to him and the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. This word received means accepts them, befriends them. We think it means he condones them. This was his criticism. When, when was the last time someone said to you, hey, hey, you need to be careful, brother. Are you saying this person's lifestyle is okay? Hey, 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 brother, do you know, do you know this person is a Republican? Hey, 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 do you know this person is a, a, is a Democrat? Now, now, my dad taught me that you can't, you can't trust them. Someone told me last week. They, were, they said to me, I need you, I need you to be careful. Uh, just be careful who you associate with. Because you can, you can be guilty by association, association. So just use wisdom. When you go to places, you need to watch out where you're going and who you're hanging with and what places you go to. You know what my response was? No. No. Permission to care. Who have you excused yourself from caring about? Who have you excused yourself from caring for? Well, well, they got themselves in this mess. You know, that they, they made their bed. They got to lie in it. Who have you excused yourself from? Well, well, my experience in growing up, my parents taught me that you can't really trust them. Them is you. We are all God's children. Who have we excused ourselves from? Well, well, you know, you know how they are. 
You know that group, what they do. You know what they did at night, last night, last week? What they did. Now, now we have an excuse to not care about human beings. Now we can categorize living human beings and we demonize them. And the great, just an amazing pastor, John Perkins said, if you can demonize, you can start to hate that person. Can you imagine if you approached me? And my wife and I, uh, when we first got married, we wanted three kids. We did. God bless us with one and a lot of practice. <laughs> but it, it, God bless us with, with one child. But let's say that our dreams were fulfilled and we had three kids. Or even seven kids. Can you imagine if you approach me and you're like, man, I, 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 love, I love you, Pastor. I love the message. You, you like these conversations where I compliment myself. It's great. <laughs> but I, I just love the message. I love what you do. And I love your wife. I, I love your family, except for that oldest one, Michaela. Something, something's off. Hey, I'm just being honest with you. I'm keeping it real. I love you. I love what you're doing. I love all but you're Michaela. So, something's off. I can't trust. I can't trust her. I keep my, my distance from her. I don't like that kid. I promise you. I promise you. That there will be a fight. And that I will have to ask for forgiveness. And I'll love you because I'm asked to love you by God. But that we would have some strong issues. Oh, Jesus, help us. Father, I love you. I just don't like all your kids. Dad, I love singing to you. I love reading books about you. I love worshiping you. I love highlighting things about you. You are a good, good father. I love you. Oh, I do not like that kid, though. You made a mistake with that one. And we think our Heavenly Father is like, yeah, 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 I get it, I get it. No, they're all, we're all God's children. Lost and found, found and lost. We're all His kids and He loves all of us. Can we be the kind of church that is courageous enough to remove, to get rid of, to pray for the Spirit of Jesus to help us reject any kind of error in which we have been taught that some people can be overlooked, that some people can be ignored, that some people cannot be loved. That is not the heart of the Father. Look at 2 Peter. This is so good. Don't overlook the obvious here, friends. With God, one day is as good as a thousand years. A thousand years is a day. God isn't late with his promises as some measure lateness. He is, re listen to this. He is restraining himself on account of you. Holding back the end because he doesn't want anyone lost. He's giving everyone space and time to change. Can you leave this up here? He's giving everyone space and time to change. And I want to ask you, are we? Are we giving everybody space and time to change? Because, oh boy, this, the, uh, sometimes the church thought is, you can come to church, but if you're not different in two weekends, we're going to have to build in some margin because you're living in sin, brother. Can we just have permission to care? Can we have permission to care? Since when did caring have a timetable? When was there a timetable? When does change have a timetable? No, permission to care. Permission granted. Thank you, Father. Thank you for the permission to care. Are, are, are you giving everyone, are we giving everyone space and time to change? Are we willing that no one is lost? What I love about home, and Nate, I want to invite you up here. What I love about home is home is home when home gets used. I had somebody apologize. I came over to their house and it was just a mess. They were moving stuff in and moving and they said, I'm, I'm just so sorry. I said, no, this makes me feel like family. Like I need to come over when things are messy. When you feel like things are falling apart. Everyone, everyone likes the idea. Let's just go love everybody until everyone shows up and your home gets wrecked. We're family. Things are going to get messy. We're going to give people space and time to change at One Two Church. Are we? Are we going to? Are we going to step up? 
We don't, have, we don't just have permission to care. It's a commandment from Jesus. Take care of him. Insert any name. Take care of them. Insert, for God so loved, insert that name that you have trouble caring for. For God so loved Matthew. Wow. Are we going to give people space and time to change? Because I look forward to the next 30 years. And then like a month ago, I said 40 years, but then I realized my age, and that's way longer than where I wanted it. But I look forward to the next 30 years as pastor of one, two church, the last pastor, or the last church that I ever want to pastor. But I can't wait. I cannot wait for more blogs and more emails that I will not read that say, well, you know, that one, two church, uh, you, you got to be careful over there. You know, they... Uh, they associate with some people that there's, you know, things are, things, are, uh, things are real gray over there. What an honor. What an honor. Jesus said, they rejected me. You too will experience the same if you follow me. We will be a church that cares. And sometimes, listen, sometimes you don't need to busy yourself explaining to, to others the difference between condoning and caring. Sometimes you don't need to go through that effort of explaining it. Sometimes you don't have to answer. You say, you know what? Pray for us. Pray for us. I, I, I had somebody come to me and say, Pastor, I need to talk to you. I said, hey, just pray for me. I'm a work in progress. God will do good work in me. I don't have the energy to explain it all. Why? Because we are busy moving towards the pain. We're busy caring about everyone. Isn't it crazy how quick some people forget that we were the ones that were a bloody mess that somebody picked up and brought them to church. How soon we forget. We all get sewed up and the stitches, you don't, they don't even show anymore. And we're so removed from that day that we were dying and broken and bloody on the side of the road. And someone's brought us in the end. And someone else cared enough to work with us, to walk alongside us. The love of Jesus. We were a mess. But give us a little bit of time. And we walk into church and we say, hey, there's blood everywhere. What's going on here? That's my chair. And someone's in there bleeding on my chair. That's my reserve seat. I've been sitting there since the 90s. Those who laugh know what I'm talking about. But how soon we forget the people that you say, Man, I, I don't know if I can care about them. You are them. You are them. Freely you have received. Freely you give. It's not us and them. It's we, church. This is we. We are all sinners who have fallen short of God's glorious standard. And one time or another, every single one of us, and maybe it's right now, we were all hemorrhaging. We are bleeding. And he found us and saved us and simply turns us around and said, now go. Tell them who I am and what I've done for you. Are we going to be the kind of uh, the church that will do that? Right now, we are a little church with a lot of people. Which means we care about every single person. If we don't live this way, we are going to be a big church with small people. With small world views, with small perspectives, with a small spirit, gossipy, category, fitting people into categories, ranking levels of sin. No, we're going to be a little church with a lot of big people, of big spirits, big hearts, and we're going to reach a lot of people with the story of Jesus. That's our future. God put us right where the pain is. And, it, and help us get dirty as we care. We need some people that are ready to get dirty as we care. And a little blood gets on us and let us remember that's what he saved us from. That's where I was saved. And at the end of our time, people will say, how'd you do it? How'd you do it? How did you love so well? How did you share, the Je how did you share Jesus so well? We are not going to say, I served myself and thought about myself the whole time. We're going to say, we looked at Jesus we fell in love with him and we said, let's just do that. Let's pray. Father, we, uh, we love you. Lord, I, I pray that we never forget that every single one of us is a gift from you. That you made no mistakes. And if you're in this room right now and you feel like you are a mistake, 
I want you to call out that lie and just say, no, that God loved me so much that he died for me, that if you were the only person in the world, he would have done the same thing. You are not a mistake. And Father, I ask that, that we run towards the pain, that we are known as a church that hangs out with the sinners and the broken and the lost and the needy. Lord, let us be that kind of church. Let us look at your words. And Lord, as hard as it is, and our, and our mindset wants to revert back to just a structured life, let us remember, Lord, that you gave everything, that you hung the law and the prophets on these two words, love God and love your neighbor. And Father, I pray that if there's anyone in this room that has not yet said yes to you, that today is the day, the Bible says you believe in your heart and speak with your lips that, that Jesus is God, Jesus is King, that he came to earth. And you're just saying yes to that, that you don't have to have it all together to come to him, that he is the good Samaritan coming down to you. And if you would like that now with all eyes closed, this is a private moment, would you raise your hand? Would anyone like that? Yes, I see that hand. Yes, I see that hand. God, you are so good. Lord, I ask that you bless everyone in this room, those watching online all around the world, to know that they are loved, that they are cared for. And Lord, let us be the kind of church that runs towards those broken and dying on the side of the road and just bring them into you. In your name we pray, amen.